Hello everybody once again. This is going up a bit later than I had wanted, sorry about that, but here it finally is, the revamped sequel to the previous video lecture, in which we are going to continue looking at motivation in games and learning, this time with an eye towards the longer term, and the question of what motivates players to stick with a game, or learners to stick with a new subject or skill, across multiple encounters. More specifically, what does intrinsic motivation look like over the medium to long term? We've already been over extrinsic rewards in the long term from the totally extrinsic prizes like pizza parties or loot boxes to more complicated rewards like grades, badges, or leaderboard ranks, which can have both extrinsic elements and some degree of intrinsically oriented performance feedback. I'm not going to go over all that again, except to say that in design terms, all of these things are best thought of as mechanics, the basic tools available to the designer to shape and regulate a gaming or a learning experience, while intrinsic motivation, especially sustained motivation, is better understood and explored at the level of aesthetics. Nobody plays a game because it has a badge system or a leaderboard. Those might be mechanics that players enjoy once they're in the game, but they're not a primary draw. So today's lecture will be all about the aesthetics of motivation, and three in particular that tie into the framework of self-determination theory, which we'll get to in just a moment. First, just to review very quickly from last time, let's take a look at our previous theory of motivation, the theory of flow. This is a really useful theory because I think it makes a lot of intuitive sense to people. Everyone seems to recognize and appreciate the particular mental state that the theory describes. It's widely applicable across all sorts of subjects and skills, and it has obvious value to the field of learning through its framing of challenge and skill in a way that's highly compatible with the zone of proximal development and that sort of optimal learning state where people are performing right at the upper limit of their ability and pushing that limit higher as they do so, which is, of course, what learning is all about. And of course, flow is also a great lens for linking learning and gameplay for a lot of reasons that we don't need to revisit right now, because I already did that in the previous lecture. But for all that, the theory of flow isn't the only way to think about intrinsic motivation, or even always the best way to think about intrinsic motivation. It has significant strengths, but it also has some limitations. Here are a few of them. First, and probably most obviously, flow is very much a short-term, in-the-moment state of mind. One of the chief features most descriptions of flow emphasize is a sense of timelessness, that you can stay engaged in a task for hours without really noticing the time when you're in that state of flow. But that only works up to a point. The limitations of the human body, at the very least, mean that we can only keep this up for so long. And even before you hit the real wall where you physically have to stop and hydrate or sleep, focus and attention to detail often tend to slip after at most a few hours, no matter how motivated we feel. And so good learning kind of stops at that point when attention begins to degrade. Flow can also be difficult to achieve because it depends on this careful balance between skill and challenge level, especially as a designer if you've got people of different skill levels like you're almost guaranteed to find in any classroom. There are ways to design for diverse skill levels, and we'll continue to discuss that throughout the course. But at a certain point, it's potentially more effort than it's really worth to try to capture this flow experience for all possible skill levels, and you're better off pursuing a different design aesthetic that is more easily inclusive and more motivating in a different way. Which brings us naturally to the last point, which is that flow is just one possible aesthetic in a game design. It's a good one, but it's not the only one, and there are a lot of great games out there that are going to be better understood in terms of other kinds of player experiences.
the appeal of flow is all about challenge and achievement, but not everyone wants that in a game, and no one wants that all the time in all the games. And in learning, too. Flow can be great, but very simply, a lot of learning experiences, good learning experiences, don't really have anything to do with flow. Learning can come from conversation or from experimentation, things that aren't really about skillful performance. Or learning can even come from moments where you have flow, but you screw up and break it, but then that pause and reset where you're more relaxed is when something clicks and you actually learn. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a new theory of motivation that covers some of these gaps and can help us approach learning and game design and intrinsic motivation from another perspective that you might find just as useful. Some of you may have encountered self-determination theory before this semester. It's reasonably popular in education. And of course, Nicholson and others have made some direct references to SDT in some of the earlier course readings. So by now you should at least have heard of it in passing, but let's take a slightly more in-depth look now. There are psychologists and educators who spend their entire careers studying SDT, so obviously we're still only scratching the surface today, but I'll try to lay out the main points and a few practical examples that connect to learning and game design. First, just as a reminder, this is a theory of intrinsic motivation, meaning motivation that is separate from any specific outcome or practical benefit of an activity. In game terms, a good way to think about it is motivation that is independent of whether you win or lose. Obviously, winning is fun, but if people only ever played games they were guaranteed to win, they wouldn't actually be games. In learning, intrinsic motivation is a little more nebulous. Ideally, of course, we would like it if students wanted to learn about things for their own sake, regardless of their relationship to grades or test scores or degree requirements. But of course, the way things work out often winds up making the grade or the test score a central concern, regardless of how intrinsically motivated a particular student is. So we are going to stick closer to the game side of things for practical examples of designing for these different motivational drives. Which I should probably talk about a little bit before we get into the practical examples. You can read the summaries for yourself, of course, but SDT is centered around these three drives that together make up intrinsic motivation. I say drives, but it might be more accurate to say needs. These are conditions that need to be fulfilled for a person in order for them to feel intrinsically motivated by something. The first need, autonomy, is the sense that you can have some independence and control over the activity in question, that you can make meaningful choices about what you do and how you do it. This doesn't necessarily mean total independence, so it's not incompatible with externally imposed goals or rewards. Like in games, there is generally an objective imposed by the designer, like defeat the bad guy and finish the story, that you have no real control over as a player. But you can still experience autonomy in deciding exactly how you go through the game and move towards that objective. For example, you can stick just to the main storyline and finish all the story quests to reach the end as quickly as possible, or you can take your time, wander, explore the game world, do side quests, mess around with the mechanics, and get around to the main story when you feel like it. The second need, competence, is the feeling that you're doing something you're good at and that your actions are effective in bringing you closer to your goals. This one obviously has a lot in common with the theory of flow, but it's less about maintaining high performance and more about ensuring that a player can see a clear relationship from their actions to the results in the game and understand what happened and why it happened. 
In other words, it's about having a meaningful impact on your situation, whether in a game environment or a learning environment, and being confident that you understand what the results of similar future decisions or actions will be. Then the third need is relatedness, which is the sense of social connection and belonging, and more generally, that your actions matter beyond the scope of the immediate situation, that they relate to a larger world of meaningful connections and relationships. Obviously, this need makes us think of multiplayer games where you work as part of a team or even compete against other players in a free-for-all, but even in a single-player game, you can still experience relatedness to other people, specifically to the game's designers who have created this experience for you, and also potentially to the metagame community through sharing and talking about your favorite games, even if you don't directly play them together. So you can probably see how self-determination theory, like flow, speaks to some underlying experiences that are easy to identify with. It has a lot of broad applicability to different situations and subjects, and has obvious relevance both to learning and to games. But a lot of the arguments I've seen around SDT, games, and learning, tend to kind of boil down to a false dichotomy between motivation in games versus motivation in the standard model of schooling, where SDT shows that games are good at intrinsic motivation and school is bad at intrinsic motivation. Games, as we've already discussed before, are kind of by definition optional. You can't really force somebody to play a game. So playing a game is an autonomous choice. Games are great at feedback and making players feel like their actions have clear and important impacts on the game world. And games are the basis for many of our most cherished social experiences, whether through playing together directly or connecting as fans and spectators. School, meanwhile, is mandatory in our culture, as is most of the curriculum up until late high school, and even then a lot of the choices available at that point boil down to which set of mandatory requirements you want to go through to get a job in your chosen career. Feedback in school is slow, it doesn't clearly connect student choices and actions with meaningful outcomes, and often makes students feel incompetent and disempowered rather than the reverse. And schools are governed by a very strict set of social controls around behavior and expression and tend to value quietness and obedience over earnest relatedness. Now, personally, I think this is really reductive of both games and traditional school models. You could just as easily say that many games are questionably ethical Skinner boxes that trick players into investing time and money and thinking that it's their own choice when really it's just a dopamine rush no different than straight-up gambling. They create the illusion of competence through contrived scenarios that have nothing to do with any kind of real transferable skill, and they pull players away from more naturally forming real-world relationships in favor of unhealthy levels of emotional investment into their perceived status within an insular in-group of other warped, broken obsessives. School, meanwhile, empowers students through exposure to many new topics and skills that they can choose to explore and pursue in their future, mediated by expert teachers who can scaffold the experience to meet the needs of each individual to achieve their best performance, and integrated into a community of peers and caring adults to foster meaningful relationships and emotional well-being as a strong basis for intrinsic motivation to learn and to grow. And I've seen both of these arguments too, and I think they're just as reductive as the other ones. The mistake in either of these arguments, besides cherry-picking just the positives or just the negatives from either school or games, is that self-determination theory is meant to be a macro theory that applies across different contexts, not a differentiator to highlight differences between domains. So the strength of SDT is in helping us identify points of commonality between games and learning, not in pitting them against each other. 
both games and classrooms can be designed for intrinsic motivation, and both can be heavy-handed and focused on extrinsic rewards. And most examples of either will feature some intrinsic and some extrinsic elements. So now let's talk about each of these three core needs as design aesthetics in games that can be used to draw players in and capture their interest and motivate them to keep coming back and fully exploring your game to learn all its secrets. Let's begin with competence, which, as already noted, ties kind of neatly into the flow framework from the last lecture. But as I said, competence is not necessarily about high achievement or even about achievement at all. Despite the name, the need for competence doesn't necessarily imply the need for success, at least not right away and not all the time. Games involve a fair amount of failure, or to use Kostakayan's term, struggle. But there needs to be at least the possibility of failure when you play, or it's not really a game, and there's no sense of competence from succeeding. Really learning a game and mastering it necessarily involves learning what works in the game, but also what doesn't work. There's probably no better game to illustrate this idea than Braid. If you didn't play it, this is a platformer kind of similar to classic Mario games, where you navigate your avatar around a series of levels full of dangerous obstacles and enemies, and collect puzzle pieces in order to... I won't spoil it. This is a great illustration of a principle that's come up several times already, that games are amazing at delivering instant, clear feedback on everything that a player does. When you take an action in a game, generally speaking, you will instantly see the result of that action and the effect that it has in the game space, and you can factor that into the next decision you have to make accordingly. This is in contrast to many areas of real life, where often you might do something and then you have to wait hours or days or even weeks before you know what the result is, whether it's the result you wanted. It's not always clear whether the result is a direct consequence of your action or other factors you can't control. And even if it is clear that it's the result of your action, it might be too late or too much work to go back and make adjustments after the fact. Not so in Braid. And what this allows Jonathan Blow, the designer of the game, to do is create these extremely difficult puzzles and challenges that demand incredible precision on the part of the player to get through and reach the end of the level. Most of these levels would be straight up unfair without the rewind mechanic, and Braid would be just way too difficult for any but the most utterly hardcore fans of this kind of game. But with the rewind mechanic, all those many, many failure points in the game turn into moments of clarity, where the game tells you here is exactly what you did wrong, and here's exactly what you need to adjust. Keep trying as many times as you need to, you will get there eventually. Feedback on failure becomes a basis for a feeling of competence, because it's instant and there's no cost to going back and trying again, and so the player can feel themselves inching towards success with each attempt until they get it just right and get past that challenge. This is similar to the ideal we hold up in education as the growth mindset that progress towards a goal is just as important, maybe even more important, than achieving the goal itself. But that can be really difficult to convey when performance feedback comes slowly, so we can't recover easily from small errors and the cost to the learner of going back and redoing something they initially failed at is high in terms of time and effort investment to get back into that headspace and apply new information to a task that they've already mentally moved on from a while ago. So I picked Braid to illustrate this general game design idea of high challenge with unlimited attempts, enabled through instant feedback. But really, Braid is just a super obvious example. All sorts of games do this. 
I'd even go so far as to say that most video games start off by setting the player a challenge that is, at the beginning, impossible. The main villain, he shoots lightning out of his hands, he just destroyed your entire planet, and you are a level 1 teenager with awkward hair and a stick. But with the power of instant feedback and low or no cost retries, every tiny bit of improvement you make in being able to navigate your character through the game world is instantly obvious. And so the player stays motivated through a 40 or 50 hour long game because they are getting constant feedback that their competence is slowly but steadily growing towards the point where they can take on the final boss and win the game. All right, so much for competence, let's move on to autonomy. Autonomy is the need to feel that your decisions matter, that you have at least some say in doing an activity, and that you're doing it voluntarily rather than out of necessity or coercion. This sometimes gets interpreted as the need to feel entirely self-directed, but that's not necessarily the case. Autonomy can also come, for example, from feeling like you made the best choice for you out of your available options in a situation. Just like competence doesn't actually require success all the time, autonomy doesn't require the player or learner to come up with the whole plan for what to do, just to have some chances to have input and contribute to shaping the details of the experience. To illustrate this need, let's look at Crypt of the Necrodancer. This is a rhythm game with only four buttons, but it creates a surprising amount of autonomy for players by confronting them with an endless series of simple but potentially meaningful choices. As you dance down into deeper and deeper levels of the game's dungeon, you will encounter lots of different rooms with monsters, magical items, and tools or weapons to equip your character with. All of these things create tactical decisions, where at any given moment you have to decide whether to attack or run away, whether to pick up a new weapon or stick with the one you have, whether to use that bomb you found now or save it for later, and so on and so on. At each moment, you generally only have one of these choices to make, and each one by itself is pretty small and pretty manageable, but they come at you several times a minute while playing, and so taken all together, they quickly add up to a lot of autonomy and a real sense that each run you take through the dungeon is a meaningful result of your decisions. I want to delve into the design background of the game just a bit to give you a sense of just how central this decision-making aesthetic is. So originally, Crypt of the Necrodancer did not start off as a rhythm or music game. This game belongs to a genre called roguelikes, which means games that are like the 1980 computer game Rogue. These are turn-based games where the player moves through a series of randomly generated rooms full of dangerous monsters and traps looking for treasure, and the basic goal is to get as far as you can before dying and having to start all the way back at the beginning again. In general, roguelikes attract players who like careful, thoughtful, puzzle-style challenges where they can take their time and plot out the best move each turn. So the original concept for Necrodancer was simply a roguelike with a turn timer, with the same basic challenge to get as far as you can through a dangerous dungeon, but instead of taking time to consider all the options and create detailed multi-step plans, players would have just a second or two to make their move each turn. But then, when the designers built the first rough version of the game and started testing it, they noticed that the feel of the gameplay was very rhythmic, and that's where the idea to turn it into a full-blown rhythm game came from. So again, Crypt of the Necrodancer is a very obvious example where the whole game basically boils down to making a long series of small, quick decisions, but the basic design idea can be found in many games, where the player is given a series of small decisions steadily throughout the course of the play session, any one of which is not super important, not intimidating on its own, but added all together, they can produce unique and very different play experiences depending on the player's preferences and goals and the choices they make along the way.
This is broadly similar to the educational philosophy of inquiry-based learning, where students are given a set of tools and conditions within the classroom environment and then decide how to use those resources to develop and investigate their own questions around the subject. This is not to say that there aren't big decisions in games or in inquiry-based learning. There are. But in between those more pivotal moments, lots of little low-stakes choices can maintain motivation and investment, and if done well, you get this strong sense of autonomy through accumulation of personal decisions and investment over time, but without the burden on either the learner or the designer of having to come up with lots of ideas and make big, intimidating decisions on the fly. Okay, last one, and I can already sense some of you wondering how on earth I'm going to do this one. Relatedness, obviously, which is the need to feel a sense of social connection and belonging, is a big concern in teaching and learning, especially after the past year where we've lost so much in terms of our ability as teachers to spend time connecting with students the way that we want to. This is such a big deal that I'm not really going to try to cover the educational side here or come up with an exemplar philosophy. We just don't have the time right now, but we are going to cover questions and design frameworks linked to relatedness and social connection in much more depth over the next few weeks. I don't think there is any credible current model of learning that doesn't acknowledge relatedness as a key element not just in intrinsic motivation or in learning, but just in overall mental health and well-being. So we will be looking at social games and the community connections that form around games in a lot more detail throughout Zones 3 and 4 and tie in some different perspectives from education at that time, but I'm not going to wade into all of that right now. We all have lives and families to get back to at some point, so this lecture has to stay manageable today. So with that caveat, how do game designers lay the groundwork for relatedness in a game? Obviously, a lot of the actual work of building a community is in the hands of the players, but that doesn't just happen in a vacuum. They need to be able to build on the foundation established by the game itself the same way you need to establish some bedrock rules and goals and mechanics in your classroom that will shape the social interactions among students during class time. Like I said before, even in primarily single-player games, at the very least, the player's interacting indirectly with the design team. So the tools of relatedness are baked into any game regardless of number of players. One way that game designers can lay this foundation for approaching a game in a way that supports relatedness is through developed resource mechanics. For one example, let's look at Rebuild 2, which is a single-player game about managing a settlement of survivors after the zombie apocalypse. But unlike many other similar city manager type games, one of your primary tools in this game is your roster of fellow survivors. These are characters with names and faces, so you can identify with them a bit, and they also have different skills, and a big part of the turn-by-turn -turn gameplay is assigning people to handle different tasks for you, like scouting, growing or gathering food, guarding the walls, and so on. You start off with just a few followers, and you can recruit more as you go, but that first handful of characters wind up becoming very important because the more you assign them to do certain things, the better they get at doing those things, and you come to really rely on certain characters to handle different priorities in the game for you. Like, you probably will hold off on scouting a new area until your best scout returns from their last mission. Or you'll kind of define your pace of expansion by how fast your best builder can repair and fortify new areas, or how much perimeter your main guards can safely cover. So, in other words, the game encourages you to invest in specific character relationships in a way that reflects a simplified version of real-world relationship building, where the more you invest in that connection over time, the more you can rely on it for support when you need to.
The same basic process applies when you want to put together a team of real players in Overwatch or a guild in World of Warcraft. And you wind up feeling a weird kind of loyalty to these Rebuild 2 characters, even though they are barely even fictional characters, let alone actual people. And you want to protect them and keep them happy, not just because they represent valuable game resources, but because you would feel bad if you sacrificed somebody who's been with you from the beginning because you pushed too hard to reach an objective. Some of the biggest game series of all time, like Final Fantasy and Pokemon, are built around this developed resource mechanic where you nurture and grow a set of fictional allies or friends throughout the game and rely on them not just in terms of game mechanics and objectives, but in terms of your emotional connection to the game narrative. Modern fantasy sports have distilled this mechanic down to its purest form, where the entire game is drafting your players and picking your lineup each week, and investing in that feeling of relatedness with those athletes, even if it's entirely one-sided. But then, like I said, that basic mindset in the game design primes you to seek out allies and friends in the real community around the game, whether directly within multiplayer games or on forums or streaming channels dedicated to discussing your favorite single-player games. And it encourages you to invest in those relationships in a similar way that gets deeper and richer over time and to rely on those connections for help in getting to the deepest levels of game knowledge and mastery. Like I said, I am just scratching the surface here and will be getting deeper into relatedness and the social connections between gaming and learning in upcoming zones. Now, it may not shock you to learn that I was definitely thinking in terms of self-determination theory and these three core needs or drives when I started developing this course. And in particular, the idea for the three challenge classes draws on these three pillars to help define each one. That's not the only consideration I was making, but it's definitely in there, and as you can see, I conceptualized each class, to some extent, as prioritizing one of the three core needs of self-determination theory. Crafting is about autonomy and making choices to adapt and customize game tools to your specific teaching and learning needs. Trading is about relatedness through discussion and sharing ideas, both within the class and with a wider interdisciplinary community through the different readings and resources and perspectives. Training is about competence and becoming an expert in selected games to be in the best position to use them effectively as teaching and feedback tools. But, although I have separated out the three core needs in order to discuss them in this lecture, like I said at the beginning, self-determination theory is a connecting framework, not a differentiating framework. And these three needs are inextricable from each other. They all feed into and support each other, and you need to develop all three to really foster intrinsic motivation over a sustained term. So although in my mind each class starts with one of these three core drives, they all connect and build into each other as you go deeper in any one of these tracks, just like they do in game design. Thinking back to the game design examples I gave to illustrate each core need, Instant feedback, like in Braid, has obvious implications for competence, but also for autonomy and relatedness by making meaningful decisions and feeling a sense of connection to the game and the game community. Giving players lots of small but significant choices, like in Crypt of the Necrodancer, builds a sense of autonomy, but it also relates back to assessing and improving competence over time and to creating a sense of identity within a game, which is an essential part of relatedness. Developed resource mechanics like in Rebuild 2 are a way to guide and model a relatedness mindset, but also they give players the autonomy to make their own decisions about where to invest resources, and they give clear feedback on how players are improving and increasing their competence through growing and improving these in-game characters. And the different classes in the course, 
whether you choose to multi-class or not, all relate to each other and contribute valuable information and perspectives for any and all of these three core needs of self-determination theory. So, that's the tutorial level on self-determination theory and sustained intrinsic motivation in games, and some of the tools we can potentially borrow from game design to apply towards building for these needs in other learning contexts. Obviously, there is a lot more to say and a lot to unpack and think about, and we will continue to do that throughout the coming weeks. I look forward to your questions and comments in the course discussion and your own ideas on designing to support these different component needs for intrinsic motivation. So with that, I will catch up with you all in the forums. Have a great week.